Hey, folks, welcome to another episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo. I am the Chief Security Officer at Security Journey, and I'm also joined by my good friend, Robert Hurlbutt. Hey, Robert. Hey, Chris. Yeah, it's Robert, and uh, Principal Application Security Architect at Acquia, and really glad to be here to talk about application security again. Yeah, it's a, it's a shocker. That's somehow what we end up talking about. But the show is called the Application Security Podcast. So you kind of knew what you were going to get when you downloaded the episode. So the topic that we have for today is talking about what is some important advice for companies that can't afford a security person. But we're going we're gonna to lay some groundwork, some foundational items before we get to that particular topic. We're joined by Halel. And Halel, we always like to start with, what is your security origin story? So help our audience understand, how did you get into this world of application security from as, as far back as you want to go? Awesome. Well, first, thanks for having me on, Chris. Always uh, nice to talk to you guys. Uh, and yeah, AppSec is, uh, is, is a passion, so I can talk all day. Uh, my background, I got into security. I was a junior developer, graduated college, looking for a job and got a job at a company that was doing security, learned all about cryptography, learned all about, you know, uh, packets and encryption and, and transmitting data across the internet. From there, I sort of never looked back. So everything I've been doing has been about developing security products and trying to figure out what's the next way we can protect applications, organizations, content, whatever it is I was protecting. Um, most recently, uh, I, I was at Cisco for a bunch of years and we overlapped there and spent some time. And then I left Cisco, started a startup in cloud security. It seemed like a place nobody was doing anything. So why not do something in cloud security? Um, and uh, sold that off to Checkpoint a couple of years back, spent some time there and left Checkpoint uh, a while back to start focusing on other startups, other projects and sort of see where else I can be uh, impactful and effective. And so everything's been about security, whether it's organization, network, application, cloud, et cetera. So when you were that in that junior developer role, what, 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 how did you make that jump? Were you, were you in a development role and then somebody gave you an opportunity and kind of piqued your interest in security? Or how did you, what, what was that flashpoint for you? Yeah, so uh, it was a bunch of moments, but uh, you know, the first one was someone said, hey, we gotta, we gotta do some security things here, let's go do them. And I had the instinct I think that every developer has, which is let me, let me go write my own security. Um, and learned uh, the hard way for the first of several times, uh, you know, the old don't, don't roll your own crypto. Uh, so, you know, ma made a bunch of mistakes along the way and learned that security is a is a discipline. It's an engineering discipline. It's built, you know, layer by layer. And what you got to do is you have to look at all the layers that exist, see how you can use the things that exist and then tie them together and then add your own little piece to it. And so I had the opportunity to do that a couple of times, whether it was on the cutting edge of things, so things that didn't necessarily exist and we were trying to create or it was, you know, yeah, we just need to encrypt our data or we need to transmit our data encrypted or we need to get our database encrypted or we need to encrypt our file system and, and let's see how we can use those building blocks. So I had the opportunity and the, and the fortune to be given some tasks that required me to do some things. Uh, sometimes I uh, overstepped my boundaries and then learned, uh, you know, where you should write your own things and where you shouldn't. And sometimes I got the opportunity to really spend time understanding the ecosystem. So cryptography was really the first uh, area, uh, you know, that I sort of fell in love with and spent time, uh, whether it was in research and product development. And then as I moved away from that into IoT security, started learning about other systems and other protocols and focused a lot on trying to see how we could secure some of those things. And then at some point thought, okay, cloud seems to be interesting. People are doing that. I think, I think maybe that cloud thing will catch on. Let me see what I can do there. Um, and, and again, you know, you got, you got to learn the discipline. You got to come humble. You know, when I, when we started the startup, I realized I didn't know a whole lot about OWASP and AppSec and I had spent my time in other areas of security and I needed to learn and I needed to open my, you know, my, my mind and stay fresh. And you start out being humble, you start out learning and eventually, hopefully you get smart enough to say something intelligent once in a while. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> That's the, you just described the whole startup journey right there. Like I start something and then I realize I don't know anything. And so I can I can also agree that that is the truth. Like you, you go into it and you're like, finances can't be that hard. <laughs> P&L, you know, profit and loss. How that, I've seen that on TV. It was in a movie sometime. But, you know, figuring all that stuff out, you're you're spot on. It's it, you you either embrace a, a life of humility or you get knocked over a bunch of times. And then you're like, yeah. you, you, you get taught some lessons in that in that particular space. Absolutely. 
So hello, uh, just to uh, sort of dive into application security programs. Um, in your experience, uh, I know we talked about uh, time at Cisco and other places, but what uh, what are the building blo blocks for application security program? Right, it's a great question. Because uh, I, I think we often talk about AppSec without even thinking about what we're trying to solve and what we're trying to do. We just, you know, we rush into web application firewalls and, and you know, RASP or something without even thinking about what it is. Um, I, I think, first of all, for me, it's always about remembering what the end goal is. And the end goal is, you know, you have an application, you have data, you want the availability, the confidentiality, the integrity of those things to be maintained. That's that's your goal, right? Everything else is just a, is just is part of the journey. But your end goal is to say, I, I'm deploying an application. I want to make sure the thing works. I want to make sure it protects my customers' data and my data. I want to make sure that it you know, continues to function the way it should. And I, I know there are bad guys out there trying to do bad things to me. And I want to make sure I can survive that, right? Uh, and then the second thing you have to keep in mind is, you know, okay, okay. Th there's some level of security that makes sense for my organization. There's some level of security that's overkill for my organization. And I, you know, I often, I've been in situations where we've put too much security into a situation and we've spent too much effort on security and found that, you know, we've crippled the product. So it is, it is worth saying, okay, am I worried about a, a nation state attack or am I worried about corporate espionage, et cetera? So once you've got those things and, you know, sort of laid out for yourself, it's okay. I'm, I'm a company. I'm worried about, you know, my customer's data more than anything else. I'm worried about my system being available more than, you know, you know, right after that, et cetera. Now you say to yourself, okay, what are the things you got to do for that? One of the things I learned, uh, you know, through Chris and through Cisco was to sort of think about this, as, you know, through the before, during, and after, uh, you, know, you know, division of labor. So what are all the things I'm going to do in order to get myself to a deployed application that'll be as secure as possible? What are the things I'm going to do during, you know, my, when, you know, the time my applications are running and when I'm under attack? And then what are the things I'm going to do when I want to recover from that and handle that, right? So we th think broadly about that. And I know the past few years, we spent a lot of energy in the world around the before, I think, which is great because I think we used to ignore a lot of the before, go right into the during and then do a little bit of after. So it's great that we've now focused a lot in on the before. We've thought about, okay, how can we do things earlier? How can we get more stakeholders? You know, it's any organization, especially a small one, which we'll talk about later, has more developers and security people, right? If, if you don't, you're doing something wrong, right? So... You know, how do I get my developers to be part of that? How do I get my DevOps engineers to be part of that? So all that before is really good. It's really about getting yourself to be deployed in a way that's as secure as possible and as you know uh, risk free as possible as you can. The during is super important still, right? You can't discount that. At the end of the day, bad things happen while you're running, not before you're running, not after you're running, typically, right? So focusing on what are the things we're going to deploy in and around and, and you know above our application to make sure that the people who want to do harm to us are going to have as hard a time as possible. And then the after is often uh, ignored, especially by small organizations. You know, the, the easiest thing to do is convince yourself, well, if I do the right things, I won't be attacked. So I don't have to worry so much about being attacked. But the reality is you need to understand whether you're under attack. That's not always so obvious. What was impacted? And then, you know, what do I do about that? How do I, how do I you know, come back from that attack? And, you know, one of the nicest things I've seen re recently was, you know, it, it's not about saying I'm never going to be attacked. It's about saying I've got a plan for if I get attacked, what I'm going to do, right? And so that after is also important. Do I have? Am I collecting the right data? Am I putting it in the right place? Do I know how to get to it? Do I know who's going to look at it? Do I know how to understand from that data what was impacted? And then, what's my program to you know re, you know remediate, fix, you know, recover, etc. So I think it's those three things. It's a lot of work, to be honest. And the more you think of it, it's a lot of work. Yeah, the uh, I hadn't thought about before during after for for i guess a little bit of time and when you think about ever a lot of companies in appsec are, are 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 spouting the you know shift left approach to the world and we have to that's really the before like yeah. before was <laughs> shift left was before before it was cool you know before it was the in thing to say exactly <laughs> exactly yeah, and I, I actually and then, recently, you know, uh, I, I, really, I recently bumped into a CISO who said to me, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm done with during. I'm, I'm just doing before. I mean, he said, I'm, I'm just shifting everything left and that's it. I said, like, you're turning off your wife? He's like, yeah, I don't care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do pipeline, CI, CD, and that's going to be enough for me. And I, it was funny because I, mm. I said, like, I understand why you want to believe that. Like, I understand the emotional, you know, goodness that comes out of thinking, oh, and if I just do these six things in my pipeline, I'm going to be fine. But man, that's not realistic. Like you know, the reality is, the really bad things happen because everything looks fine, and then it just wasn't suddenly. So, you know, you got, you got, it's, it's that yeah, balance. I mean, it, you come back to, I mean, when did when did we start talking about defense in depth? Like a hundred years ago or something? I can't remember exactly <laughs> when on the in the on the calendar. But you know, that age old principle 
it's funny how some of those some of those security principles from the seventies that were created by folks in the U.S. government still hold true today. Something oh, yeah. like defense in depth. You even give that example, like you can do all the shifting left in the world that you want, but if you don't have something like a RASP or, or some level of protection while your application's in production, you're going to you're gonna have something happen that's outside your control. You're never going to get right. to the point where your pipeline is 100% effective catching everything. And so yeah. that's, that's, it's an interesting thought. I think it's going to end up in peril in, in neglecting, you know, the, the, the running applications in production. And then it almost sounds like also not thinking about the incident response side, you know, on the, in right. the after, yeah. you know, how do you clean up and learn from that from a retrospective perspective? The only way we don't do this again is to learn from that experience. And if we don't stop and learn, how do we ever, how do we ever uh, prevent repeating our, the same problems over and over again? Yeah. And then it's, it's worth saying that uh, across all three of those areas, the, maybe the biggest thing we don't focus energy on is making sure our people are trained to do the things they need to do. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, I, I bought a product, I put it into my, my pipeline, but did I train my DevOps engineers to look at the output of that and be, and be useful with it? You know, I, I bought a product for runtime security. I'm running a RASP engine. Did I train and, and, and give people the, the knowledge they need to understand how that's going to work, what's, what it's going to impact and then how to manage it and what happens if things go bad? And then maybe the biggest one is incident response, right? You know, so, okay, I'm a startup. Yeah, I'm, I'm dumping everything into, you know, some file in S3 somewhere and I know the data is there, but do I have anybody who knows how to look at that? Just make sense of it? You know, do I have a plan for that? Like, I think that piece is also really often neglected. I mean, I'm in the, I mean, right now I'm working with a company that's trying to sell a tool. So I, I don't want to discount the value of tools and tools that can, can be useful to people uh, who don't have a lot of training are, are, are really great, but it doesn't get rid of the fact that we need to know how to use the things and the processes that we put in place. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of times we deploy a tool and we don't, we don't prepare people for the tool, meaning to your point, we don't train them on what is the technology that I'm giving you as a developer. And we wonder why developers push back on tools in the pipeline right. when they get 10,000 results the first time. Oh, you need to fix all exactly. these things before you can yeah. push to production. Well, there's 10,000. It'll take me 152 years to, to fix these 10,000 items you've just given me. Right. And to, so the, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's, you know, tools are crucial. Like we're never, we're not, I'm never going to suggest, I mean, what would I have in my pipeline if I didn't have tools? Like it would just be a straight line code comes in, pushes to production, right? Like we have to have things to do automation, to do, to increase the speed of which we can deliver software. But we do have to educate those people on how those tools work and what are they going to get from it? Instead of making the tool about us as a security program, let the developer know, here's the advantage of this tool. Here's what you're going to get from it. Here's how it's going to make your life easier. Here's how it's going to let you go on vacation and not have to worry about these things when you're not here. And that's, that's one of the crucial, crucial points. So I want to transition and talk about AppSec now at some different sizes of companies because we've, you, you Halal did a great job of laying the, the groundwork of, you know, what are we thinking about when we say AppSec and from a program perspective, but let's say we took like startups, mid-sized companies and enterprise companies. Uh, in your experience, what, what does AppSec look like in those different, different sized organizations? Right. So obviously, you know, large organizations typically have evolved security teams that have a program in place and they've bought a lot of tools, you know, their, their biggest challenge is, you know, things like, I hate the phrase single pane of glass, but at least it illustrates the challenge of, you know, I've got a lot of things in, the, in, in place. I need to figure out how to use those things. How do I make value out of those things? Right. And then, uh, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is I've got 43 tools, but I'm also not fully covered. So do I really want to buy another tool? And what's the overhead of that? So those organizations have big programs. Uh, they are, you know, they're also large machines. They're ships that are hard to steer. Uh, they've got a lot of developers and a lot of groups doing a lot of things. And so for them, the challenge is, yeah, I've got an evolved security team with well-trained people and the budget to buy good tools, but I'm also dealing with a much larger, much more complex, much more heterogeneous organization that, you know, I need to somehow secure, right? And that's not easy. Uh, when, you, when you go to the other end, startups, again, sometimes nothing, unfortunately, uh, that's the reality. I think that's getting a little bit better. Uh, I think there are, uh, you know, one of the companies I work with, Protect Once, is a good example, but there are a bunch of companies out there that are really focused on letting developers 
do security early and do security uh, well without being super high high end trained. So there are ways for startups to sort of balance the fact that it's not just about budget; it's really about the energy, right? As, as a startup, and, and you know, we've been in these places, and I've, and I've been there. If I if I sit at the beginning of an epic or a sprint, going, okay, what should I do? Should I you know add disaster recovery capabilities or should I add features? Right? You know, I often think, okay, what, who's going to write the the press release to my customers about the fact that I turn you know added disaster recovery or I enabled single sign on or something? Right? It's not exciting. Whereas if I turn you know, so I'm, you're always motivated to add, add security features and you're always limited in terms of sort of your, your budget and capacity and people. So some startups I think are really skipping over it, and that's obviously a real shame. I think that's getting better. I think you can do some of the fundamentals today, uh, whether it's driving towards compliance, which a lot of times you need to do in a startup, or even just getting an AppSec program in place to have you know some something happening in your pipeline, something running at runtime to protect you, some thought about whether you or some outsourced you know, program can help you if something happens and is in place to do that. I think there are startups doing that, not enough to be honest. Those mid-level, mid-sized organizations, I think in some ways are maybe in the easiest spot, and I know that's a counter you know counterintuitive thought, but it's just saying, you know, if, I, if I'm if I'm a 500 person organization, I've probably got an AppSec team. It's probably three or four people, but I probably don't have 15 or 20 different application teams developing applications in, in different languages and different cloud platforms. Like I I might have an environment that's close enough to you know homogeneity to be able to say, okay, here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to we're going to run an Amazon and we're going to use AWS WAF and we're going to buy Palos this and checkpoints that or whatever. And we're going to have four tools. I'm going to write. So it's like. You're, you're big enough to think about security, but small enough to actually try to solve the security. I'm kind of envious of those guys more than anybody else. Yeah, it's kind of the sweet spot, you know, is the is that mid level. Like you said, they they you think about like, you know, I think about my time at Cisco. How many products did we have? A lot. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know if anybody oh knew how many total products we had. Somebody probably knew somewhere, but I never saw the number. And there were, but there were a lot of them. There were probably more than a thousand individual. And you talk about individual SKUs, there were probably millions of SKUs that, that made up all the products and stuff. And so, you know, being able to secure at that level is, is there, there's, there's just an organizational data problem that you have to solve before you can even get to how do we do AppSec? The question is, what are we going to, what do we need to secure? Right. Whereas in the mid-level and startup, to your point, there's, you, you, you've got good visibility in front of you into here are the things that, that we need to secure. You know, that mid-level company with 250 people that has one product is really in the sweet spot because there's right. not, there's not, you know, we're not doing this for multiple, you know, even a couple of different products and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a, uh, it's 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 good to it's good to think about these things in the context because I know we're going to transition to talking about kind of you know maybe even the most the most smallest of companies. Right, and with that in mind, hello. Um, what's your most important advice for those companies that can't afford a security person? So it could be a startup or, or even maybe a midsize. Yet they're still trying to figure out how do we do security, but they don't have a person yet. What's your advice? Yeah, so I, I often get that question from people, and the, you know, usually the question is phrased, well, I don't really have a security team. What should I do about security? And the simplest answer is you should have a security team, right? Um, and, you know, it, it could be one person. It could be half a person. It could be somebody who's got other roles. You know, um, uh, you know, the company I work with now, Protect Once, there's, there's a guy who's in charge of security research. So he spends about half of his time on securing our own product, and the other half of his time he gets to spend on researching how we can make our product better, uh, you know, creating more content for us, things like that. So it doesn't have to be a, a full-time person. It doesn't have to be uh, 100% of the time, but there should be somebody who is knowledgeable in security and is responsible for security in, or, in the organization. So that's that would be ideal. Now, you still get pushback from people saying, listen, we're six people, we're bootstrapped, we're building a product, let's be realistic. And obviously that happens, and I've been in those situations, so I understand. Uh, so still, I would say, even if there's no security person, somebody gets the hat, you know, that you can't share responsibilities. So you got to decide... Maybe it's the VP R&D, maybe it's the CTO, maybe it's the CEO. I don't know who, you know, what, what everybody's capabilities are, who wears that hat of, okay, what are we doing to make sure that when we talk to a customer about our product and they say to us, is it secure? It's secure. Because remember, it's not just a nice to have. It's not a luxury, right? You're going to get those questions from your customers. You know, what are you doing to protect my data, right? And so you have to have something in place where you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing something. I'm encrypting, I'm protecting, I've, I've thought about it. I've, I've got, you know, the right IAM roles and I've got the right network configuration and I'm using the right tools. Uh, and then the other thing is there are tools out there. That's why I say it's a little bit more solvable today than it was in the past. I think in the past it was more forgivable that someone said, 
I can't really. I mean, how am I going to? I can't run a, a, a network firewall. I can't do that. I can't run a, a web application firewall. You know, kind of take energy it takes to configure that thing. Uh, those things are still true, but there are tools out there that are you know designed for those scales. There are tools out there that have really good sane defaults. Do you get a hundred percent security? We already agree there is no hundred percent security, right? So it's all about now. Okay, how, how many layers do you have? How well configured are they? How much value are you going to get out of it? You know, what I say to people is, you know, again, even as a small organization, put put the hat on somebody, decide what you're most worried about, think through what are the, what are a few tools that you can use and put together and the process around them that will still give you value, right? And so if if it's if application security is your key focus, focus on application security. Find something that'll easily let you put security into the application, give it, put it in the hands of the person who can use it, come up with some thinking about what's it doing for me, how's it configured, how do I know it's working, can I test it? If you can't test it, you can pay someone to test it, right? There are people out there that will happily come in and spend a week or two with your product. It's not incredibly expensive. You can afford it, even as a small startup. Uh, and I and believe me, I, I, I've I've done that thinking. In other words, I'm I'm often the guy in the office going, eh, can't we just you know not buy the you know you, bottled water and save a dollar and a half a week, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, you can afford today to outsource you know, pen testing or security evaluation to a team that'll come in and help you. There's ways to do it. It's, just, it's really about focus. It's really about saying, okay, this is important to me. Uh, I know I'm not going to do everything, but it's important to me. Let me think through about what the most important parts of it are. If it's application security, if it's cloud security, maybe you come to the conclusion that for you, you're a, you've are got a really complex cloud deployment. You need to make sure your cloud security is in place. All right, there are some tools out there that can help you. There's some really great tools now uh, at CI CD. By the way, some open source out there that's fantastic. You can do some stuff with Chekhov today and in, 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 you know, Terraform scanning that's really powerful. This, even without paying, you know, it, paying for tools, uh, as long as you want to pay with time and effort, even as a small organization, you can get it done. And the last thing I'll say is, and this is the one that it's really hard for a small organization to reconcile is, you can get attacked. I don't want to say you're going to get attacked. If you're small enough, you might be a small enough target, but bad things can happen even if you do everything right. And so it is worth having a one page plan even that says, okay, here's how I'm going to know that I got attacked. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's my big red button that I press. Okay, and it, it, it can be again. It can be some managed service that you're using. It can be a guy that you have, you know, who's a consultant. Who's, you, you come in. There are plenty of these consultants out there that will come in and save your butt when you need it, right? But you can, don't, you don't want to go find them at three in the morning when your application is behaving weirdly and you're not sure. You want to know in advance that you know at three in the morning you say, hey, you know, guy, listen, I got a problem. Can you come in and take a look? You know, six hours later, know you were staying. So I think planning for that is maybe the hardest thing for an organization to reconcile because. It's like it's like all QA, you know. It's like it's easy for me to think about what my product should do. It's hard for me to think about all ways my product could go wrong. So sort of think, okay, what what could really go wrong? It's hard, but I, I think ultimately the bottom line is you, you can do it as long as you figure out how to scope it, and as long as you recognize that somebody has to be responsible for it. Yeah, I always I always wonder why why does every incident begin at three o'clock in the morning? I don't know. I mean. I used to be a director of incident response and my pager back in the days when we had pagers and the, you know, we'd, we'd be on call and I was kind of like the second level of if it got through our on call responder, it, they would, they would come to me and it was always somebody who hadn't done enough planning. So at three, by three o'clock in the morning, they were, had reached the frazzle state of right. um, hardly being able to communicate other than yelling at you into the phone. So, um, yeah, that's, the, that's the, the world of incident response. But, yeah, that's a great point that having at least even just a one-page description of what, what, what are we going to do when we get punched in the face? Yeah, yes, it's a plan. It may change. You know, things may be adapted. But sitting there, if, if when you have that first incident and you have done no thinking about it, talk about mm. panic it's you have yeah. no idea where to go and so um, on the other side from thinking about what you were saying about you know with it with startups and the need for security I, I think it even needs to be I, th I think startups need to just start w w they need to just start embedding security no matter what they're doing or, or where they are in their process I think we've reached the point in the market you know, you, we can remember back, I mean, how long ago was it? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where you could skate by without having a story for how you're protecting data. But even just getting, you know, for the people that are that are have small, small startups right now that are trying to find product market fit, like trying to get that first enterprise customer. Uh, if, if you haven't gotten there yet as a startup and, and uh, you guys on the uh, on the line here have experienced this, you're going to get this. 200 question security uh, document you're going to have to fill out. 
And if you haven't, if you're going to have to go back and try to retrofit your product when you get that security document, you're going to be in for a world of hurt. So it's better to at least maybe it's a lightweight process for AppSec. Maybe it's to Halal, what Halal said earlier, it's adding a couple of tools. You can There are open source things. doesn't mean you have to go spend a million dollars to, to build out a pipeline of security tools. There are some open source. There's a lot of good commercial stuff as well that for startups is, is, is inexpensive. But having that strategy, that architecture from the very beginning is going to make that getting that first enterprise customer because what you don't want to do is, is get an enterprise customer on the hook and they're like, oh, this seems like a pretty interesting tool that might help us. And then they go through their security because you're not going to have SOC 2, of course. They, you go through their security questionnaire and you can only get, answer 50% of the questions as we do this, we do this. The other 50% you are like, no, nah, we don't do that. We don't encrypt data at rest. Oh, okay. Well, we're not buying your product. And so that's right. been my experience as well. And so I think we can push the bar. Uh, we need to push the bar in the startup world to say basic AppSec is something that is just a minimum bar of entry if you want to work and play in the enterprise. Yeah, I agree. And along with that, I was going to say, along with that, it's something you mentioned uh, that I've heard as well is I'm too small. You know, who, who cares about me? And that's gone. You can't say that anymore because uh, attackers like the small stepping stone to get to the bigger fish, if you will. So um, absolutely, you have to uh, take that that perspective that it, it's not about being too small anymore. Everybody yeah, needs and, and to be thinking about this. And there's ransomware that will come after you, even if you're small, it's all automated. You know, the, the attackers have found ways to target small fish and make lots of money off of them. So yeah, absolutely. Nobody's too small to need security. And I, and I agree with your, your point, Chris, I think uh, th there has been a good job done. We're not all the way there yet on holding even startups accountable, right? And saying, you know, th these questionnaires are really valuable in the sense that they they do make it so that you can't get that far as a startup before somebody puts a big bar in front of you and says, wait a minute, you know, have you, do you have a plan in place for when employees, employees leave? Do you have a plan in place for uh, when you get breached? Uh, you know, have you encrypted your data at rest? You know, no, I, I really don't. And, and mind you, each of these things, you know, is somewhere between 10 minutes and two days of work, but when you multiply it by 200 and you, you need to do them over the weekend to get that questionnaire in, you're, you're in for a world of pain, right? And so, for sure, uh, I know it's a cliche, but for sure, doing it earlier is easier. Um, the other thing is what we've gotten better at in some areas, but not enough, is the idea that developers and DevOps engineers and architects can be part of the solution, right? Because as a, as a small organization, again, I have no security people, but I have six or seven or 12 developers and, and DevOps engineers, and, and, the, and they can be part of the solution if... I'm thinking about the right tools, right? And so we've gotten good, like with the, you know, vulnerability management and software composition, we've gotten better now at not just creating tools that can work earlier, but actually helping developers understand that this is part of their job, right? And security is just another non-functional requirement for their product. And if security means making sure that I'm not running an old version of, you know, Log4j, then that's my job now. Okay, fine, right? And the flip side of that is developers are not security people. Bringing them dashboard-based tools that send them, you know, messages to, to their Slack or something with problems is not the way they need to solve problems. Developers need, you know, underlined code in their IDEs and they need pull requests in the, you know, in, in GitHub and they need tools that speak their language and they need tools that talk to them like people who understand they're part of the security solution, but, but are not trained security people. You know, don't, don't start, you know, throwing lots of OWASP jargon at me instead of telling me what I need to fix, right? Show me where my problem is, show me where the solution is. So if you combine that, we're saying, well, I, I actually can leverage my development team to be part of the solution, but I can do that by finding a tool and a process that speaks their language. That I think that can work really well for startups. You know, start with the things that you can do that. You know, do that way, do well. Uh, eventually, you'll get a you know full XDR, incident response team, SOC, etc. But you know, e even as a small startup, you can do a bunch of those things. You can rope in those people and make them your friends and make them you know help out. Yeah, I like that idea. That you know, security. And this is something that I, I believe and talk about all the time. I mean, security is everyone's problem. But in the small startup, it really is everyone's problem. Because to your point, you might not have a you know, you might not have a dedicated security person like we've been talking about here. And so you have developers, they understand the technology, they can they can adapt and get these tools integrated and get you to that basic level of AppSec, which will hopefully get you over that first hurdle of answering that security questionnaire and you know. Um, if you can, I've been through so many of those questionnaires that I'm um, starting yeah. to shudder a little bit, but, and I'm starting to sweat like from it. 
<laughs> it's like, why didn't I just get sock two earlier? So that I could throw the sock two card down on the table and go, nope, I'm good. I don't need to answer all these things. I've already done this with an auditor. But So Hillel, from your perspective then, we like to leave our audience with some type of a key takeaway, a call to action. So we talked about AppSec in this world where companies can't afford a security person. What would what, what, what should our audience do with this conversation? Like what, what, do, you, what do you want to direct them to or what do you want to you know, leave them with here uh, in, in regards to this conversation? Well, the, the world that I'm hoping to live in um, at some point, um, besides being COVID free and the stock market going back up, uh, is a world where uh, I think we, we found a way to bring developers really into the story, into the mix for security, uh, but without trying to throw security at them as their responsibility. I, I know I've tried that and failed, and I don't think that's a, a working solution. So I think this world where we found a way to say, look, security is a feature of the product. Uh, and in the same way that we figured out that we can't separate testing from product development, uh, we can't separate security from product development. It's it's more and more of our remediation happens with security people, more and more of our discovery happens with security people, sorry, with developers, and more and more you know, of our, our, our remediation happens with developers. And so being able to empower developers to be part of our solution, but without trying to say to them, oh, guys, hey, now security is your problem. You know, there's no AppSec program anymore. Go for it, right? Because that won't work. I think that's what we're, you know, we, we really need to solve to. I think we, again, as I said, we've done that pretty well for parts of security, the things I think that are easiest to shift left in meaningful ways, but not just shift left, but, but really empower developers to be impactful on. I think we can do better. Uh, you know, we're focused by us on doing that for, for the runtime parts of AppSec, uh, you know, putting those in developers' hands, which is, I think, a little bit more out there and a little bit, you know, maybe a little crazier, but I think, we, I think we've, we've managed to, to crack that nut. But really that notion of whatever it is I'm doing in AppSec, part of that impacts developers, whether it's how do I find out where the problem is, how do I solve the problem, or how do I react when the problem, you know, pops up, and finding those ways. So I guess the key takeaway, if I boil it down, is if you're a developer, try to find a way to be part of the solution. If you're a security person, try to figure out what am I doing to make sure that my developers are empowered and motivated to be part of it without trying to be you know, uh, offensive or trying to sort of shift the responsibility off myself because that just doesn't work. Very cool. Well, hello. Thank you for taking the time to share with our audience this perspective on AppSec programs. And we talked about the different sizes and then this advice for companies that, that can't afford a security person at this point. I think there was a lot of good, good nuggets of information for both the startup and the large enterprise that things they can glean from this conversation. So we look forward to chatting with you again in the future.